So we're back to, um, to uh, multivariable calculus. And before I begin the new topic, I wanted to, to add a couple of things to our discussion last Thursday about um, formulas for the area in polar coordinates. Remember, we discussed polar coordinates. And um, one of the questions which arises here is one of the questions which arises here is to find the area of um, the following kind of picture. You have a curve. which is given by the equation r equals f of theta, where r and theta are the two polar coordinates which we introduced last time, right? And uh, in these polar coordinates, the natural bounds for such, a, for such an area would not be the vertical lines like x equal a, x equal b, the way you know, we used to do it in rectangular coordinates. That's the whole picture. Now it's more natural to, to give bounds in terms of the angle theta. So it's going to look like a sector like this between some angle alpha and beta. And so we will assume that alpha is less, than equal to, uh, is less than beta. And theta will be between alpha and beta. And so we look at this um, figure, which is bounded by the lines theta equals alpha, theta equals beta, and, and the curve. This is the curve. And the question is to find the area of this. So I just briefly touched uh, on this uh, at the very end of last lecture. And I just wanted to tell you how to get this formula, which I wrote down without, without explaining it last time. So the idea is, again, to, to, break, this, um, to break this picture into small, into small angles which would be some within some angle delta theta. And say here well, you'll have r. And, and just look at the area of this sector in the disk. Right? So we approximate now our curve not by, not by horizontal lines or line segments, but we will now approximate our curve by a, a small segment of a circle, because that's more natural. That's a more natural object in the polar coordinate system. OK, so, so the question then becomes, what is the area of, um, of, this, of this little sector? In the polar coordinate system, the analogous picture would be like this. So we would have some delta x and delta y, right, and delta y. And so the formula for the area would be just delta x times delta y. Right, and uh, or more precisely, in fact, we don't look at it as a delta y, but we just look at it as a y coordinate of a, of a graph. So it would be more precisely y times delta x, and that's what, after applying the procedure of breaking into small pieces, uh, give us the formula for the, for the area in terms of an integral like this, y dx. In other words, y delta x, the elementary area, gives rise to this integrand y dx. So we have to approach this problem in exactly the same way. But now, instead of calculating this area right here, we need to calculate the area of this wedge, of this little wedge, of this little sector. And this is actually not so difficult to do, because see, the point is that we know the area of the entire disk. Um, so if you have a disk of radius r, we know the entire area. What's the area of the disk? Pi times r squared, right? Area is pi times r squared. And uh, OK, so now suppose we're, we're given, say, one quarter of the disk. What's the area of, of, the, of, the, of, this, of this quarter of the, of the disk? 
will be one quarter of this, right? So that would be one quarter. Why one quarter? Because the angle enclosed here is pi over 2. And so one quarter is pi over 2 divided by 2 pi, which is the, like the full angle of the disk. So in other words, if you want to calculate the area, not of the entire disk, but of, of a part of the disk which is enclosed within the angle of pi over 2, you have to multiply this result, pi r squared, by the ratio of the angle which is enclosed to the total area of the disk. So it would be pi over 2 divided by 2 pi. Right. So that would be 1 quarter of pi r squared, which of course we knew in the first place because clearly this is going to be 1 quarter because there are four pieces which are exactly the same. But let's suppose you are in a pizza restaurant and you, are, you have a piece like this with angle theta. And they didn't cut it in a very uniform way, so you don't know exactly. It's not pi over, it's not pi over 4, it's not pi over 6, or pi over 3, whatever. And you want to calculate what area, how much pizza you got, and then compare it to how much your friends got. Say, maybe they got more, so they should, they should share, maybe give you, back, give you back some. So what would be the answer? Well, we should, we should argue in exactly the same way as before. Before, that angle theta was pi over 2. And what we did, we took the ratio between pi over 2 and 2 pi. And now, instead, we'll have a ratio of theta to 2 pi. That's, that that's what will represent the piece that we got, as, opposed, as, as a sort of the ratio of that piece to the entire disk, to the entire pizza. And therefore, the area would be pi r squared times theta divided by 2 by 2 pi. Right? So pi cancels out, and you end up with 1 half r squared times theta. That's the area of the sector of angle theta, which is exactly our question, except in asking this question, we called it delta theta instead of theta. So this area is, um, is 1 half r, r squared delta theta. And that's the analog of this formula, y delta x. So just like this formula, y delta x, gives rise to this integral, this formula for the elementary area of the, of the, of the elementary wedge of angle delta theta will give rise to the integral from alpha to beta, 1 half r squared d theta. You see, it's exactly the same. Just kind of replace delta theta by d theta. And that's how we get that formula, which I wrote down at the end of last lecture. So to summarize, the key to calculating the areas like this is to, be able, is to break the, the, the figure that you got into small pieces, which will then look like elementary figures. Like in this case, would be an elementary rectangle, which is where I magnify, I blow it up, and I show it there, calculate its area, and then it gives rise to the formula for the area of a general picture like this. Whereas in the polar coordinate system, you do exactly the same, but you kind of follow the, the shape of the figure is different because the coordinates are now different. So now we split it into little sectors like this, where the angle is delta theta. I magnified one of those pieces right there. I found the area of that little piece by thinking about pizza and um, calculating it, right? And, and then I put all these little pieces together, and this gives, gives rise to this integral, OK? Any questions about this? So that's the way to calculate. That's the way to calculate the area in polar coordinates. And there is a similar formula also for the arc length in polar coordinates. But the formula for the arc length, I don't want to spend time on it, because we really take the formula which we derived in the, in the rectangular coordinates uh, about a week ago. And we just make the substitution where x is equal to r cosine theta and y is equal to r sine theta, and then just see what comes out. And what comes out is, is, some, is some formula in terms of r and theta, which you can then use to calculate the arc length. So that's the way we do it for the arc length. Here it's more conceptual because we change the point of view slightly. Instead of looking at rectangles, we look at these sectors. It wouldn't be wise to try to break this into rectangles because they don't fit in this picture. What fits perfectly in this picture are these little sectors. So then we need to calculate the area of the little sector, which we've done here. OK. So this, speaking of pizza analogy, these were the leftovers from last lecture. 
And now, it's not, a, it's not what you say, it's how you say it, you know? So delivery is, a, so I'm, wor I'm working on it. Now, so now we, we go, uh, we move on to, to our next topic. And the next topic is vectors and geometry of space. And space here means three-dimensional space, which surrounds us. You see, up to now, in the last three lectures, we talked about objects which are defined on the plane. Here, I've been drawing curves on the plane. And we've discussed various things about those curves, like arc length or various areas which are enclosed by those curves. But the basic point, the, the most important aspect of what we've done up to now in this class is the fact that we have worked exclusively with object confined to a plane. And by a plane, I mean this blackboard or sort of infinite, an infinite extension of this blackboard in all directions, right? All our objects have been defined on this plane. But now we want to move on. As I told you at the very beginning, we are in this class, we are going to study not just objects on the plane, but also objects in space, in the three-dimensional space. And uh, in the three, because we live in a three-dimensional space, if you don't think, if you don't count the time. So the, in fact, we live in four-dimensional space-time, but that's, that would be a topic for the next calculus class, I guess, four-dimensional space-time. Now we'll do, here in this class, we do two-dimensional space, the plane, and three-dimensional space. So three-dimensional space is more interesting because it fits more objects. More of, of, now it fits not just curves, and there are a lot of interesting curves which are, appear in space which, cannot, which are not confined in any particular plane. But also, perhaps more interestingly, it contains objects of dimension higher, namely two-dimensional objects, the surfaces, like a sphere, for example, or, or, or this, this, this wastebasket. You know. These are all surfaces, if you, if you ignore the fact that they actually they have certain thickness. So what we'd like to do, ultimately, in this class is to understand the geometry of those surfaces as well as curves and to be able to answer various questions about them, like finding their areas and uh, even, more, even more sophisticated things. So what we, do, what we need to do now is to sort of lay the groundwork for this. In other words, we have to develop some formalism because how are we going to represent curves? How are we going to represent surfaces in the three-dimensional space? What's the most efficient? So, um, Always check for uh, batteries before you begin. So in space, we need, to, we need to develop some technique in order to attack these problems. And uh, the very first thing that we should talk about is a coordinate system. Because you know, and on the plane, it sort of goes without saying that we, st we started out with, whenever I, I, I start writing, uh, drawing a diagram, drawing a picture, or drawing a curve, I draw this coordinate system. We kind of, it's almost like a reflex. I say, and usually we call them X and Y, the two coordinates. Um, after last week, we kind of, uh, we are wiser now, we realize that this is actually not the only coordinate system that we have available for, for the plane. For instance, the polar coordinates provides us a different coordinate system. But this is the basic one, and we should start thinking about a similar coordinate system in the three-dimensional space. So this is the first step that we have to make. Uh, coordinate systems. Now, of course, the problem is that even though I'm going to talk about the three-dimensional space, I'm still going to draw things on a two-dimensional blackboard, right? So of course, I cannot draw this wastebasket on, on, this, on, this, uh, on this blackboard. What I can draw is really a projection. So I kind of, we kind of create the illusion that there is some depth in the picture, and we try to imagine that the, three dimension, the third dimension is there somewhere. So the, the way we, know, we usually would draw coordinates would be like this. So that, of course, the point is that they are not on the same blackboard. Only this one and this one lie on this blackboard, and this one is sticking out. It's sticking out, but what we are looking at kind of slightly from above, and, um, and that's why it appears to us this way. So now we want, to, we want to label these coordinates in a certain way. 
in the, on the two-dimensional plane, we label them x and y. And in fact, some of you may have wondered why we label them x and y and not, and not for y and x, not in the opposite, not in the opposite order. Why not like this? Of course, in a sense, it is, uh, the notation is arbitrary. We have chosen uh, these letters once and for all, so in a way, you can say that it's not a meaningful question because it depends on what we mean by X and Y. But of course, what is important here is not so much which letters we use, but the ordering, the implicit ordering between X and Y. X comes first and Y comes second because that's how they are ordered in the alphabet, right? So we could use Y and Z, and again, we, it will be assumed that Y goes first and Z goes second. So there is actually a basic asymmetry between these two coordinates, X and Y. And uh, we don't talk about it much, we haven't talked about this much when we talked about curves, but in fact now is a good time to, to, to discuss this and to realize that there is a basic asymmetry. The point is that you could work with a coordinate system like this, XY, or you could work with the coordinate system yx. And these are not equivalent to each other. There is no way to transform one into the other without removing them from this plane. Of course, if I were able to, uh, maybe I should draw it more like this. If I were able to pick it from the plane and flip x and y, I would, of course, then, um, I would get back to, it, to this picture, x and y. That is a more traditional picture we draw, right? But we cannot flip them within the plane. You can argue, well, what if we just try to move these coordinates like the, you know, on the clock and kind of move them and make them go through one another. But that's not allowed because then you, they would have to pass through each other and at that point they will cease to be a coordinate system. They will become parallel to each other. So that's not allowed. So in fact, if you think about it, you will see that there is no way to transform one into the other. There is no way to transform one into the other by, by moves confined to this plane. And that's a very important point, which tells us that actually our plane has two different orientations. Choosing one or the other, this coordinate, this coordinate system or the other coordinate system, um, gives it orientation. And the funny thing is, suppose that there was another class behind that blackboard, and there were people there like a mirror image of this one, the bizarre world, if you will. And suppose there were kids, you know, sitting there and also uh, learning uh, multivariable calculus. Then this one, one of them, the, the first one would appear to them as the second and conversely. I mean, not exactly, but if you, if you rotate, that that's exactly what you'd get. So, what it, in other words, the orientation from this side, there is orientation from this side, when you look at this blackboard from this side, and there is orientation of this blackboard from the other side, from the bizarre world side. And these are two different orientations. There are two different worlds. And you can transform one world into another within the plane, within the confines of the plane. If you go into this three-dimensional space, you can do that. You can just pick it up and flip them. But inside the two-dimensional space, you cannot do that. At first, it appears as a kind of a nuisance, and uh, you may think that's not a very important point. But actually, and in fact, for the plane, it's not so important. But in three-dimensional space, it becomes more important, and that's why we emphasize it. In three-dimensional space, we also have different choices of writing coordinates, um, labeling, of, of labeling coordinates. And in three dimensions, we will label coordinates as x, y, z. And of course, again, the mo most important point is not so much which letters we use, but the ordering in which they appear. And the ordering, of course, will be the natural one, one, two, three, just the way they appear in the alphabet. But then the question is, how do you assign? There are, there are now many choices to assign these letters to, mm, to this coordinate axis. And the question is, are we going to get always the same coordinate system? In other words, are we going to get coordinate systems which can be transformed one into another? by moves within the three-dimensional space. And so now, since I've shown you that in two-dimensional space on the plane, that's not true. In other words, in, on the plane, there are two different coordinate systems which cannot be transformed into one another. You would not be surprised to know that actually 
Here as well, in three-dimensional space, there are also inequivalent coordinate systems. But you might be surprised to know that, again, there are only two choices, not more than two. So the choices are basically the one which we will always use will be like this, x, y, z. And the other choice, which we will not use, which is not equivalent to this one, which is, which is a bizarre world coordinate system, is this one. And then z again. In other words, we switch x and y, just we did before on the plane. Just the way we did before on the plane. If you try the other choices, for example, you put x, y, z like this, there are, you will see that there are many different ways. There are six different ways to label them. You will see that uh, that picture can be transformed by simple rotation into one of these two pictures. So really, there are only two inequivalent ones up to rotation within the three-dimensional space. If we could go into the four-dimensional into four-dimensional space, if there were a fourth dimension that we could visualize, just the way we can visualize the third dimension when talking about the plane, we would actually be able to pick it up and transform one coordinate system into another in that four-dimensional space. But since we don't have a fourth dimension, or more precisely, the fourth dimension, time is kind of elusive. It's not easy to visualize it. So within the three-dimensional space, we cannot do that. So we have to agree from the beginning on what is the rule. What is the rule? for labeling these coordinates because we have to do it now because from now on we have to use the same system so we are on the same page or on the same blackboard. Now, what is the rule? And so the rule is there are different ways to phrase the rule. And the, the rule is, is um, in the book, it's, ex it's explained by using fingers. But I always forget that. So I'll tell you the rule which I use, which is, you know, I grew up in Russia and um, we use the rule which is called the corkscrew rule. And, and this is not to say that Russians like to drink. <laughs> but anyway, it is called the corkscrew rule. And the way it works is like this. If you rotate the corkscrew from x to y, so here is the corkscrew. I, I kind of draw the, the, most, the basic one. If you rotate it from x to y, then uh, this, the thing will go in the direction of, of, the, of the z, of the z uh, axis, right? In other words, if you, well, it's not a good picture because then the bottle would have to be upside down, but you see what I mean. <laughs> so if you think about the, um, the corkscrew going from x to y, which is natural, right? Going from x to y is like going from the first coordinate to the second. In going from x, going in uh, making a rotation, as if you were moving the x, co x coordinate system to the y, co sorry, x axis to the y axis, then the, co the screw will move, move in the direction of the z axis. So that's the rule which I find easy to remember. Even if I don't have a core screw on me, it's easy to remember. But you can use whatever rule you want. You just have to remember that there is such a rule and to draw this picture in this way. Okay, so that's the first point that we have to make about this. The second point is we have to develop we have to develop some tools for representing objects on uh, on this on this uh, in, in space. Okay. So the first I, I already told you that the objects will be mostly mostly interested in. I'm still looking for a battery, but I guess. No luck. So uh, the objects that we are mostly interested in are curves and, and surfaces. But in fact, there are simpler, more elementary objects, namely points. So before we talk about you know, these complicated matters like curves and surfaces, let's talk about points. In the case of a plane, we know how to represent a point. We just drop the perpendicular lines onto the x and y axis, right? and say we get x0 and y0, and we represent the point as x0, y0, like this. And we are going to do the same in the three-dimensional space. So I draw the same coordinate system, and I'm thinking, okay, if I go from x to y, they're going to be z, so that's how I should put them. Because if I put them in the other way, I would have to move the core screw this way, and it would go down, so z would have to go this way. So this is a good orientation. 
This is, this is the orientation we've chosen. And uh, our mirror image will have the opposite orientation. So if we have a point, we, ha we also can represent it by co its coordinates. And now there are going to be three coordinates, obviously, because we are in three-dimensional space. And the way we find these coordinates is as follows. We drop the perpendicular lines, line from this point to the plane, x and y. Now, you have to, at this point, you have to use your, your imagination, and you really have to think of x and y as a plane which is sticking out like this. And the point is actually not here. It's not, a, it's not in the z, y plane, but it's here. So you've got, like, I can't show you because my, one of my hands is busy with the microphone, but you can, you can see, I'm trying. So this is a plane, and the point is here, so you drop the perpendicular down like this. So you get a point on the plane, which is the x, y plane. Now, I draw it like this. So the point is somewhere in space, and that's where, that's where, it, that's where it drops. So now I get a point in the x, y plane. But a point in the x, y plane, we already know how to represent. We just drop the perpendicular lines to the x axis and the y axis. So what we got already is y0 and uh, x0 coordinates of this, of this point. The two, of the two of the three coordinates. What about the third coordinate? It is tempting to draw a perpendicular like this, but that's not true, right? To give it really a depth, to give it uh, the illusion of a three-dimensional picture, I have to do it in the following way. I have to connect the origin to this point, which is the, which is the point I got by dropping my original point on the xy plane, and I have to connect to the z-axis by a parallel line. So this one and this one are parallel to each other. And that's going to be the z0 co coordinate. You see, the point is that this is perpendicular to this entire plane. So in particular, it's perpendicular to this. And that's why the z-axis is perpendicular to this line. So what I'm doing, really, is I'm dropping perpendiculars to each of the three coordinate systems. But the way I draw it is slightly complicated because I'm using the two-dimensional projection of the picture. It would have been much easier if I had a three-dimensional model of this whole thing. So then you would see more clearly where, what, are the, what the coordinates are. But I think it's, it's fairly self-explanatory here. So if we have this picture, then we will say that the point has coordinates x0, y0, and z0. And this is in complete analogy with uh, the situation that we have, the picture that we have in two dimensions. So nothing, nothing surprising here. What else do we need to know? We need to know the distance between two points. Right? So for instance, we would like to find, find oftentimes, let me use a different chart. Oftentimes, we might, might want to find the distance from uh, from uh, this point to the origin. Let's call this uh, R. So we need a formula for this distance. And um, in two dimensions, we know that this distance is computed by a very simple formula, namely square root of the x squared plus y squared. And now the formula is going to be very similar. It's going to be. Um, the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Okay? So, so very similar. Instead of sum of two squares like this, you have the sum of three squares. And then you take the square root. And that's how you calculate the distance from this point to this point. And it's very easy to prove this by using Pythagoras' theorem. It's, it's, it's in the book. I'm not going to get into that. It's very easy. All right. What if we were, what if we were to calculate the distance between two different points? Actually, so you could have a point P, and then you have another point P prime. And say here you have coordinates x0, y0, and z0. And here you have coordinates x1, y1, and z1 for this one. So the distance, so you see the point is that 
this you can to find this distance you can just parallel transport this interval to the in such a way that the first point would end up at the origin. And if you do that, the second point will have coordinates which are just the differences between the coordinates of the original two points. So this point will have coordinates x1 minus x0, y1 minus y0, and z1 minus z0. Okay? So the distance, let's call it, let's call it d here, the distance will be then, according to this formula, the square root of x1 minus x0 squared plus y1 minus y0 squared plus z1 minus z0 squared, just like this. Is this clear to everybody? Okay. And, and this already gives us a way to describe a very important surface on, in space, namely the sphere. Because the sphere is defined as the set of all points which are equidistant from a given point. So for example, let me raise something. Let's talk about the sphere of radius r with the center at the origin. These are all points whose distance, all points p, whose distance to the origin, origin I denote by, by this letter zero. This is not to, I don't, I don't mean the, the number zero, but I mean this point, it's, it's really not zero, but it's point O, although it looks like zero. So points whose distance to, to, to the point O, to the origin, is equal to R. And R is, is some fixed number, right? So what does it mean? It means that the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared, where x, y, and z are coordinates of the point P, will have to be equal to r. Because that's exactly the distance. And if we say that the distance is equal to r, then that's, that's the equation we get. Now, it's, 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 it's a good idea to square both parts, both sides, left-hand side and the right-hand side. So then we get the equation x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to r squared. And that's remarkably similar to the equation of the circle. So compare with the circle, circle for which the equation is x squared plus y squared equals r squared. Here now we have a third variable, and so we just add the third square to the left-hand side, but otherwise the equation looks very similar. So now we have an equa the equation of the, of the sphere with, with this centered at the origin. And again, you see, remember the rule which I explained to you at the very beginning, that if you want to calculate the dimension of an object, you have to take the dimension of the ambient space, in this case three, and subtract the number of equations. Here I've written one equation, so the dimension drops by one, and we get a two-dimensional object. So we get a sphere, which is two-dimensional. Two-dimensional object. It is a surface. Surface is, by definition, a two-dimensional object. And likewise, we can write the equation for a sphere, which is centered not at the origin, but at any given point, by using this formula. So if I say that this is equal to r, that would be sphere of radius r centered at the point p. That would be the equation for x1, y1, and z1, with x0, y0, and z0 fixed being the 
coordinates of the point P. All right. So we already have some rudimentary knowledge of the three-dimensional space, and we know uh, an, the equation of, uh, of one basic, su basic surface in it. So what's the next step? The next step is to introduce objects, to, to introduce a new tool, to introduce objects of a different kind, which we have not used yet in this course. And these objects are called vectors. And you will see that these objects are very, um, uh, are very useful for precisely for studying the kind of questions that we'll be interested in, like finding areas, representing objects, and so on. So the next step is to, uh, is to talk about vectors. So how many of you know vectors? Oh, all right. So maybe we should ju just go home. <laughs> okay, but let me just go briefly, let me give you an overview, so I will not dwell on it too much then. So what is a vector? A vector is an object which is, uh, which is different from numbers, um, which we have studied so far. So, so far we studied different objects. We, studied, we know numbers, we know points, for example, on the plane. Points on the plane are not numbers. In, uh, they are represented not by a single number, but by two numbers. Right? And in fact, they are not, uh, they are more somehow than uh, two numbers because they are a point is a geometric object which is positioned somewhere on the plane or in space. So a point is something which has a position, which is a position on a plane or in space. And a vector is an object of uh, yet another kind which is characterized by two properties. It has a magnitude or length and it also has a direction. So, so we usually r draw vectors as, as, as directed line segments. So it is convenient to, to draw a vector as a line segment like this, connecting a point A to a point B. And you see, when I do that, I give it two properties. One is a direction, because this arrow points in that direction. And the second is a magnitude, or the length. And the magnitude is the, di is the distance between the point, point A and point B. Okay? But now the question is, how, do we how are we going to represent vectors in, in practice? In other words, uh, in practice, we will represent points by their coordinates. So we should discuss also how to present vectors by something like coordinates and various operation on vectors. What kind of things can we do with vectors? And here there is a subtle point, which is very important, which is that, which is that in fact, a vector is not really a picture like this. But vector is really what I said, uh, something which, which is just determined by its direction and, and, and its magnitude. In other words, if you take a, if you take a parallel if you take a parallel transport of this, if you just move it to another pointed or um, directed segment like this, with say points A prime and B prime, and you make sure that the directions are exactly the same. In other words, that these two lines are parallel and they point in the same direction, and the lengths are the same then actually we will not distinguish between these two vectors. You see, we will not distinguish between them. So the, the, a vector is not really a pointed, a pointed segment or a directed segment. It's a whole class of directed segments. A vector is, this is one representative of, of this vector. This is one possible way to represent our vector as uh, a, a directed segment going from the point A. But you might as well start at the point A prime and you would represent exactly the same vector. So usually we will denote vector by a small Latin letter like A and we'll put a, an arrow above it. And, 
in the first approximation, you can really think of a vector as just an arrow like this, which has a direction and magnitude, but you have to realize that many different ar arrows represent the same vector, namely all parallel arrows parallel to each other, pointing in the same direction of the same length, represent the same vector. So then, of course, the question is how do, can we possibly work with these guys because they are, there are so many possible ways to represent them. Well, that's where we have to start using our coordinate system. So we draw our coordinate system. And again, we remember the rule x, y, z. Right. Now, as I said, the same vector a could be, written, could be represented in many different ways. But to, to find such a way, we have to pick the initial point. Once we pick the initial point, then it's, it's already the, vector, the, the, the arrow is determined by that if we're drawing that vector A. But amongst all the points on the plane, once we introduce the coordinate system, there is the origin, there is a special point. So we might as well, we might as well draw a representative from this class, from this whole set of possible arrows representing this given vector. We can draw one of them which starts at the point at the point of the, at the origin of this three-dimensional coordinate system. So the result is, and I'm trying to draw it parallel to this one in some sense, but although in my previous discussion, I kind of, I was kind of working on the plane, but now I'm, I'm working in space. So in fact, this end point is not necessarily on the plane, is not in, necessarily part of the blackboard, but it could be, again, hanging somewhere in the middle, like on this picture, right? So now the vector A gets a much more concrete realization. It is a pointed interval or directed interval, or directed segment, but now it goes from the point O, from the origin, to some point P. So that, that's already much less ambiguous. In other words, once you introduce a coordinate system, you have a preferred representative for all possible arrows giving you the same vector. And then what we'll do is we will write that A is equal to OP. Or in this case, we'll write that A is equal to AB or A prime B prime. In other words, different notation in which you use the initial point and the end point and again put, put, put the arrow on top. So from this point of view, it looks like a vector is, a, is essentially just determined by its, its end point because we agree to use as the initial point the origin. So the only freedom we have is where to put the end point. So it, it looks, at first glance, it looks like there's no difference between a vector and the point. But th this is misleading. You have to realize that this is misleading and actually there is a lot more to the vector than there is to a point. Even though when we represent it in this way, the vector will essentially be determined by its end point once you center it or make the initial point to be at the origin. And really the main difference is in the meaning of this, in the physical meaning, physical interpretation of, um, of a vector as opposed to a point. A point is just a point. It's located somewhere and it knows nothing about the rest of, the sp of space. But vector really is something else. Here we talk about a vector being a pointed interval but in fact, a much better way to think about it, of a vector, it's much better to think that the vector is a transformation of space. A vector is a shift of space. Because um, what do you need to know if you want to shift something? What do you need to know? Well, it's, it will be much easier to, uh, to express this in, uh, instead of, uh, instead of a three-dimensional space, it will be much easier to explain this on the plane. So let's use this analogy. So I have this table, I have this chair, okay? So it's on the plane. So think of it as a kind of representation of a point on the plane where the plane is the floor or the podium really, okay? So I, I wanna shift it so I move it in this way. What do I need to know 
to, uh, what do I need to say to, in order to explain how to, how to move it? In other words, if I ask one of you to move it, I have to explain which direction and how far, right? So, and suppose I ask you to shift everything. In other words, I can ask some workers to come here and shift this podium. I will say I want to be closer to you, so I want to, so I want to move this podium, you know, whatever, one yard closer. What does it mean? It means that each point of this podium will be moved by one yard in the same direction. That's the vector. A vector is a rule by which you shift all points. And then if you look at a particular point, like a point A, then a vector will displace it or shift it to a point B. If you look at another point, A prime, this same vector, this same rule, will shift it to a point B prime. And the point, the origin, will shift it to this point P. So this is a much better way to think of a vector as a, as a rule for displacement, for sort of parallel transport of the entire plane or the entire space. If you have such a rule, then you know where each point goes. And that's what each arrow represents. And now it becomes much more clear why different arrows, as long as they are parallel and have the same magnitude, correspond to the same vector, because they are part of the same rule, part of the same shift rule. You see what I mean? Yeah? Any questions about this? This, this is an important point to, to remember, um, to kind of understand better what's the kind of stuff that we're going to do with vectors. All right, but that's sort of a physical interpretation. But now, more, more concretely, we would, like to, uh, we would like to work with vectors and try to represent them in much the same way as we represent points, say. So a point has three coordinates. So now we want to, to represent vectors also in a very concrete algebraic way. What I talked about up to now is kind of geometry. I draw pictures and I explain the, the geometric meaning, but now I would like to do some algebra. I want to represent my vectors by, uh, by some coordinates or some algebraic um, objects. And it's clear what we need to do. We simply need to place the vector, the initial point of the vector at the origin, and we have to keep track of the end point. And the end point, we already learned how to, um, how to, Describe, we describe it by its three coordinates. X zero, Y zero, and Z zero, right? So if that's the case, then we will write the following. We will write that A is equal to X zero, Y zero, and Z zero. So what happened? We are using exactly the same information as the information provided by the point P. But because now the point P is really not the central object, but it's something which is just, uh, we just sort of an auxiliary object, which we just use to understand the vector, because that's the end point for the pointed interval, which we obtain when we apply our displacement at the origin. Right? So the point P sort of has, plays a secondary role here. Nevertheless, the point P has a very nice representation by x0, y0, and z0. So we might as well use this information because it uniquely determines our vector. Because we agreed that the initial point is at the origin. So all we need to know is the end point. And the end point is just this. So that's why this information is sufficient to represent a given vector. But when we write it like this, we want to distinguish this notation from the notation which I use for the point P itself. For the point P itself, we use notation with the round brackets. And we don't want to write it here like this, because if we were to write like this, we would be saying that this is a point. But it's not a point. As I keep trying to explain to you, it's not really a point. The point in question here, namely the point P, is really just the end point of the vector. But the vector has a lot more, uh, it carries a lot more information or has a different geometric interpretation than just the point. So we have to separate the notation for the vector and the notation for the point, and the way we do it, we use this angle, angular brackets instead of, the, uh, instead of the round brackets. And to someone, it may appear like we are too pedantic, and it may appear like, what's the difference? Well, the difference is, as we will see now, that vectors actually have a lot of structure. We can add two vectors to each other, we can multiply a vector by a scalar, and so on. 
a point, a point doesn't have such a structure, or points don't have such structures. We are not allowed to add two points. We are not allowed to multiply a point by a number. A point is just a point. It's static. It just sits there. A vector is a kind of a dynamic thing, which, as like I said, is a transformation of the space, of shifting everything in the same direction and by the same magnitude. So if you have two vectors, two such shifts, you can actually do them um, you know, one after another. And therefore, you get a third vector. You get the sum of the two vectors, and so on. So in that sense, a vector really is a different object than a point. And that's why we really have to distinguish between vectors and points and use a different notation. So this is notation, notation number one. Notation number two. We, amongst all the vectors that we have on the plane, we introduce the basic ones. The basic ones are the vectors which go from the origin in the direction of one of the three axes. I mean, from the origin in case you want to apply it to the origin. But in fact, as I said, you can, you can apply it to any other point as well. So these are, there are, these are the following three vectors. One of them, one of them goes along this axis and has length one. And it's uniquely determined by this. Because remember, vector is uniquely determined by direction and the magnitude. So amongst all the directions in space, once we introduce coordinate system, you have three basic directions, x, y, and z. So why not use those three vectors? But then you have to say which magnitude. And the simplest magnitude would be one. So you got yourself three different vectors. This one, this one, and this one. And we'll call them i, j, and k. Okay. And so the point is that we can also write this vector as x0 times i plus y0 times j plus z0 times k. In other words, we can decompose any vector as a combination of multiples of the th three basic vectors. Which, of course, immediately begs the question as to what do I mean by addition, by the addition of vectors, and what do I mean by multiplication of a vector by a scalar? But I'm kind of slightly jumping ahead because I know that you already know most of this material. Let me just remind you, let me just remind you that a simple rule how to add two vectors. There's a so-called parallelogram rule. Do you remember the parallelogram rule? Yes or no? No. Oh, someone said yeah. But most people don't remember. Should I remind you? I remember. OK. So the rule is like this. If you have two vectors, a and b, and you want to calculate what is a plus b, then the way you do it is you apply the two vectors to the same point. Again. A vector is a rule, it's a displacement rule. So each point knows where it goes, right? So now we have two vectors, so we have two rules. So let's apply, let's apply both of them to the same point. And it depends, uh, in, your, in, your, in the problem you're solving, there will be some natural point to which you would want to apply, apply them. Now, to find A plus B, what you need to do is you need to draw a parallelogram which is spanned by these two vectors. In other words, you draw a parallel line to this one, parallel to this vector. And th at this point, you draw a parallel line to this vector. So this and this are parallel, and this and this are parallel. And then these two lines will intersect somewhere. And that's, your, that's the end point of the sum. So that's the vector a plus b. Where if this is a and this is b, then that's a plus b. Explanation of this rule. Like I said, it's better to think of a vector as a displacement rule. So now you've got yourself two displacement rules, A and B. Each of these rules can be applied to any point whatsoever. OK, let's apply first, let's apply first of them A and then apply B consecutively. Let's apply them one after the other. So first we apply A. Now we have to say to which point do we apply it. Well, let's apply it to this point. 
There is, the end result is that we get here to this point. After this, I would like to apply the displacement rule B. And like I said, displacement rule B can be applied at any point. Here I drew the result of its application to this point. What will be the result of its application to this point? Well, I have to take a parallel line of the same length. This will be a, a directed interval which will represent the same vector, right? So I end up, the net result of these two, two, two displacements, this one and this one, is that I end up at this point. That's why the composition of the two, or the sum of the two vectors, is this vector. So it's a very simple geometric interpretation. If you draw the picture using this parallelogram, this is called parallelogram rule. If you draw it using this triangle, it's called a triangle rule. But the, essence, the, 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 the meaning is the same. Is this clear? Okay. We can also multiply, we can also multiply vectors by, by scalars. When I say scalar, I just mean usual numbers, real numbers. Uh, what does it mean? Well, here we should think, we should think of a, of a vector as a direction and a magnitude. When we multiply by scalar, we we, uh, well, it depends on what kind of scalar. Let me, let me rephrase it. If you multiply by a positive number, if you multiply by a positive number, this will be a vector in the same direction and the magnitude will be C times the magnitude of the original vector. So the picture will be something like this. This is the original vector. Let's say you want to take, this is A, and you want 2A. 2A is going to be like this. So th this distance will be twice the distance of A, right? And you have the same direction. If you want negative 2, or if you want any negative number, it will have to be the opposite direction. So this is, for example, negative 2A. So, same direction, C less than zero, opposite direction. Opposite direction. So you have two operations, addition of two vectors and multiplication of a vector by a scalar. And uh, here I combine these two operations. I take my vector i and my, I multiply it by x0. What do I get? Well, according to the rule, I have to get something which goes again along the x axis and now has length which is equal to, the, to x0 times the length of this guy. But the length of this guy, just like the length of the second guy and the third guy, j and k, is equal to 1. So when I multiply by x0, I get something which has length x0. So it's just the vector which ends at this, at this point. And likewise, if I take j times y0, I get a vector which ends at this point. And if I take the third one, k times z0, I get this one. And now it's not difficult to see that if you take the sum of this vector, this vector, and this vector, you will get this one. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to, uh, for you to figure this out. So that's, that's how you get the second, the second representation of a vector. This is the first one where we just keep track of the coordinates of the endpoint. This is a little bit more descriptive because it, it really emphasizes the fact that it is, um, the displacement is a superposition of three displacements, one in the x direction, one in the y direction, and one in the z direction. All right, so what's next? Next, we have to um, work out some tools for, for dealing with vectors. And um, 
And these, two, these tools are the so-called dot product and the cross product. So how many people know what dot product is? Okay, that's better. So I'll, I'll go quickly over this. By the way, an important point is that I tried to do all of this in full generality, in other words, in the three-dimensional space. So you see that I'm writing everything in space, I have three coordinates, my vector has three components, and so on. But you can do the same analysis on the plane. If you are on the plane, If you are on a plane, you can also represent vectors in a very similar way. The only thing that will be different is that you will be missing the last coordinate, the last component. That's all. Right? Because now you will have two coordinates, x and y. You can still talk about vectors on the plane. And you can uh, transport this vector to the, in such a way that its initial point is the origin. And then you will have two coordinates. You have some point P. You'll have two coordinates, x0, y0. And so your vector, let's call it um, again A. This vector A would be written as x0, y0. So see, just two, just two components instead of three. So if you do a homework exercise and you are given a vector in this form, that's how you know right away that it's a vector on the plane and not in space because you only have two components. Or you can also write it as i x0 times i plus y0 times j, where, one more time, i and j are unit vectors in the x direction and the y direction. So same, same kind of representation on the plane is in space. Uh, now I will talk about dot product and, and cross product. And uh, dot product also is perfectly well defined in, on the plane. You, formulas are very similar, but I will not write them. They will be easy to derive by using the formulas in, three, in the three-dimensional space. The cross product, the next operation that we'll introduce, only makes sense in, in space, not on the plane. So we'll only work with it in space. Okay, so what's a, cross, what's a dot product? First, first comes a dot product. So you've got two vectors and a dot product is a certain operation, okay? It's a certain operation where you're given two vectors and you produce a number. So this is very important. You start with two vectors, but you get not a vector, but you get a number. This is different from, say, taking the sum of two vectors. The sum of two vectors is, again, a vector. You start with two vectors, you get a vector. Also, a scalar multiple or mul uh, multiplication by a number, C times A, you start with a number and a vector, and the end result is a vector. So when you think about all these operations, addition, scalar multiplication, uh, dot product, cross product, the first thing you should remember is what is the input and what is the output. It usually has two inputs and one output, like sum. Addition, two inputs, both are vectors. Output, also a vector, right? So dot product. Likewise, it's an operation. And you know, you can think of it as a kind of a black box. It's a black box. There are two, there are two inputs, and there is one output. So there is some rule. Something happens here. So it, it, it eats two vectors and spits out a number. Okay? So the two inputs are vector and another vector, vector 1 and vector 2, and output is a number. So I have to give you the rule how this black box works. And here, the important point is that there are two ways to represent this rule, which is actually very nice because then you can compare them and you can derive some useful information about vectors, which we'll use. So what is the, what is the rule for the dot product? 
So the rule, num rule number one is now I would like to draw, to draw them on the plane or in, spa uh, in space. So, I, well, I, al I always draw everything on the plane because that's all I got. I got the blackboard. And thank goodness because, you know, if I had a three-dimensional thing, it would be uh, much more difficult. But now I have these two vectors, A and B, and I would like to give you a rule how to produce a number out of them. And so there are two rules. And rule number one, we'll only use geometric information about them. So it will be kind of a geometric formula. So what I'll use is the magnitude of the two vectors. You see, this one has a magnitude, which, again, is just the length of this pointed interval. And this one also has a, has a length or magnitude. Sometimes I call it length, sometimes magnitude. Um, it's the same thing. And there is one more piece of geometric information, namely the angle between them. Now it's a sharp angle, but actually in general it could be obtuse angle. They could even be opposite to each other. But anyway, there is an angle between them. So the dot product, first of all, the notation for it is if this one, if this one is A and this one is B, this is called A dot B, which is why it's called a dot product. All right. What's, what, so what, what is it? It is the length of the first one times the length of the second one times the cosine of the angle between them. This is a vector, this is a vector. This is a number, this is a number, this is a number. I take the product of these three numbers, so this is a number as promised. I start with two vectors, I get a number. That's the dot product. Rule number two. Up to now, we have not used Algebraic representation of a vector. An algebraic representation of a vector has two, you know, we have two different ways to, to package this information about the vector by using these three numbers, x0, y0, and z0, which is obtained in this way. So let's suppose that A is x1, y1, and z1. Actually, let, let, me, uh, let me write it on a different board so that I don't have to. Then rule number two I might as well write it there. Rule number two is that A dot B is x1 times x2 plus y1 times y2 plus z1 times z2. In other words, I take the x coordinates and multiply them. I take the y coordinates and multiply them. And I take the z coordinates and multiply them. It's very easy. Just like this, multiply, 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 add them up. That's the number I get. And it's sort of, it looks sort of as a miracle, the fact that the two definitions, two rules, are actually equivalent to each other. And, uh, but it's actually very easy to prove. It's very easy to prove that this implies this. By using this presentation. Actually, uh, maybe it, it is actually may, might, might actually be worthwhile, worthwhile doing this to give you, uh, because actually the funny thing is in the book, they explain it in the opposite direction, from rule two to rule one, which is much more difficult. So I think it's, it's actually much better to, 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 to take the, rule, the first rule as a definition. And that's often the case, that the best definition is geometric, because it's, it has a nice interpretation and um, usually has a much deeper meaning, like here. It's something which has to do with the structure of the vectors and the position of the vectors, uh, the way they are situated on the plane or in space. Whereas the second definition is algebraic, and it's really a working definition. It's something which is very useful in calculation, but might not be so useful for conceptual understanding of, of what we are calculating. 
So usually the, the right way to go is from the geometric definition to the algebraic definition. And that's the way it works here. So you see, and I would like, to, I think it's a good idea to actually do this, to explain this to you, because here I will illustrate different rules of, um, of dot product in regards to uh, addition of and multi scalar multiplication of vectors. So you see, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to rewrite this in a second way. I'm going to write it as x1i plus x2 uh, y1j plus z1k. And likewise for the second one, So far, I've done nothing. I'm just using a, an equivalent notation. But, but now, it's, it's my, it's, it's, you will see how that this is actually better. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the dot product by using the second definition. Okay, so now it looks like a product of two, two things. And it's tempting to open the brackets the way we would normally open the brackets if we were calculating with numbers. Now, a priori, it's not clear that this is, um, this is allowed. But in fact, you can, you can justify this by using, uh, by using rule one. So the point is that actually um, we are allowed to open the brackets in the same way as we open the brackets when we do calculations with numbers. So when we open the brackets, we are going to end up with each of these terms on the, each of the terms in the first sum dot one of the terms on the other side, right? So this is going to be x1 i dot x2 i. Now, in principle, I have to write down how many? Three times three, nine terms. Okay, but I'm going to save. I'm going to save some time. So I, I, I'm going to to, to 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 see the following: that there will be terms of two different kinds. In one of them, they will have matching vectors like i dot i. There will be three of them: x one i times x dot x two i, y one j dot y two j, and z one k dot Z2K, right? So these are the three comp summons that I will get, which will involve the same two vectors, II, JJ, KK. And then I will have cross terms. I will have terms which will involve, say, I and J or I and K and so on. So let me just write the first one of them, X1, I, and you will see why I will not need to write the rest of them. X1, I, say, times Y2J. And so on. So there will be, I mean, I'm skipping five more terms, but all of them are going to be cross terms. So now I have to, to calculate each of this. I mean, to calculate each of these uh, terms, each of these nine terms separately. And for this, I will going to use the following rule, that if I have x1 i, say, dot x2 i, I can pull out the numbers. I can pull out the scalars out. I can pull out the scalars and put them outside of the dot product. Right? So that's the same as x1, x2 times the dot product of i and i. So what's the dot product of i and i, i dot i? Here is my vector i, and I want to take dot product with itself. Now the rule is that this is going to be equal to the length of i times the length of i times the cosine of the angle between them. But the angle between them now is zero, right? It's because I take the same vector twice. So this is one, this is one, and the cosine of zero is one, so this is one. The dot product of i with i is 1. So the net result is x1, x2. 
So this first term gives me x1, x2. Likewise, the second term, y1, j dot y2, j will give me y1, y2 because I will need to calculate the dot product j dot j. And that's again one because j is a unit vector. Same calculation. And finally, z1k dot z2k will be z1, z2. So the first three terms will give me exactly the answer of the, which appears in rule two, x1, x2 plus y1, y2 plus z1, z2. What about the cross terms? Let me calculate the first one of them, x1i dot y2j That's x1, y2 times the dot product of i and j. And what's the dot product of i and j? That's zero, right. And the reason is that now the angle between them is pi over two. And the cosine of pi over two is zero. So when I apply rule one, I see that i dot j is zero. So all the cross terms will disappear, and I will end up with rule number two. So you see it's very easy to go from, from rule one to rule two this way. And now the, the main point is that you can actually use, you can put these two rules together, and this will allow you to find the cosine of the angle between two vectors. When you just, when you just know, once you know the, the three components, right? Because you can turn this, you can turn this around and you can say that the cosine of the angle can be written as the ratio of the dot product. What, is this time? I think I have one more minute, no? Okay, well, you, you got the idea. We can turn this around and calculate the cosine from knowing the length and the dot product, okay? We'll, we'll continue on Thursday.